Well, hello, uh, my name is Greg Child and I'm sitting here at the Banff Centre about to interview a couple of fellows who uh, have been in the media a lot lately. On my right is Lincoln Hall and beside him is Andrew Brash. And we're going to talk about some wild days on Mount Everest and the aftermath of all of that for both Lincoln and Andrew. And I, I want to really kind of get down to the, the nuts and bolts and the, and the meat of this story. Um, we're here because you nearly did not come back from Everest. That's right. And you're one of the rare people that gets to tread that tightrope between life and death, quite literally. So Lincoln, let's, let's take it up from the moment you're on the summit of Everest, morning of May 25th, and everything's looking pretty good. Yeah, it was fantastic actually. Uh, perfect day, virtually no wind, no one else up there, which was an enormous privilege in a season where hundreds of people summited. Uh, and I felt good and strong and uh, I could see some people coming up towards us. I thought, well, we've got to get down here before they come up and we get a roadblock. And There was, uh, yeah, I mean, we had the whole day. It was 9 a.m. Beijing time, you know, two hours earlier if you step your foot behind into Nepal. Uh, so we had a whole day to get down to somewhere safe. Uh, I knew the descent would be hard because, you know, the last few days to the summit of Everest, you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're dehydrated, no matter how much you try and drink. You have, you know, it's, it's really hard. You, you're really stretched. And so you're exhausted from the effort as well. And then you've got to get down. And so I knew the descent would be uh, hard, uh, but it, it got to the point where I was so exhausted that I just wanted to melt into the snow with exhaustion. And that's what I did. And uh, I basically, well, I didn't lose consciousness, but um, I actually don't have any memories of what happened directly after that. The, what had actually happened was that I was struck with cerebral edema, which is a uh, fluid retention within your skull, and obviously your skull doesn't expand, and so it puts pressure on your brain, and your brain doesn't work, and generally it kills you. That's what happens with cerebral edema at high altitude. So my mind, there were no memories from what happened, but the Sherpas told me that I, was, uh, that I, that I went crazy. I've rescued someone with cerebral edema, so I know that they're aggressively uncooperative, uh, they just want to sit in the snow muttering nonsense. It's like having someone very drunk, you try and drag them, you know, 10, 15 metres and they just collapse in the snow again and start the muttering nonsense. But what I was doing, I was trying to jump off the Kanchung face, I wanted to go up the mountain, uh, and uh, the Sherpas had to sort of get ropes on me and pull me down like a bull who's going to be castrated, you know, that kind of thing. You know. And so they managed to get me down to the second step. I had a little sleep halfway down the second step. The second step is the, the hardest part of the climb, whether you're going up or down. And, uh, and then I came off the second step um, with a big fright, and uh, that brought me back into a sort of lucid state so I could suddenly appreciate the urgency of the situation. Unfortunately, because of all my shenanigans higher, higher up, I had no energy, so I was sort of crawling along and the Sherpas are pushing and pulling me, and then there's parts I don't remember. I do remember finally getting to a point where I could move no further. And Pembo, one of the Sherpas saying, you'll have to spend the night here. And I remember th wanting to say, oh no, I'm not gonna do that. But I just didn't have the energy to even speak. And that was sort of the last interaction I had with anyone until, uh, well, no, I had some, I had, there were some hallucinations which included people, but the next real contact was with Andrew uh, 12 or 14 hours later. Well, well let me set the scene. So you've, you've come down, to the Hillary step from the summit. You know, Not the Hillary step, the second step. The second step, sorry. We're on the north side. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got down to the second step, but in, in that intervening time, let's set the scene. Uh, how many Sherpas are with you? Okay, well, there were three Sherpas were climbing with me because the rest of my climbing team had sort of, uh, well, we, um, no, yeah, the, there were three Sherpas with me, but when another of our team died, the expedition leader uh, asked Pemba, who was at the second step at that point, to come up and help me because I was in difficulty. So I had four, four Sherpas with me, mm -hmm. Pemba, uh, Lakcha, Dawa Tensing and Dorji. And uh, yeah, so that's, they were the people who got me to the, uh, the, the being at uh, 28,000 feet, mm -hmm. 8,600 metres, which was the point where mm -hmm. I could no longer and move. And I presume that uh, 
on the radio, these Sherpas are, are telling those at base camp that you've lost the plot. Yeah. And everyone's getting quite concerned. Uh, yeah, but they obviously, they were making progress. They were, they were making progress, so, uh, and there were, from base camp, members of my expedition, the people I had been climbing with, were trying to radio me, and uh, I'd had my radio turned off, I think, save batteries. And um, finally one of the Sherpas put a radio to my mouth and I talked and I sounded much more together than I actually was. Mm -hmm, mm. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the meantime, Andrew, you know nothing of any of this. You probably barely even know Lincoln. Uh, do you even know <coughs> Lincoln at base camp? Well, I had heard of Lincoln. Actually, when I was a young guy, I saw Lincoln's video, White Limbo. Uh -huh. And I, I had heard about the White Limbo. I knew about his name and the climb he had done before. And I'd met his Russian expedition because uh -huh. they knew the doctor from their team from a Kazakhstan trip I did two years ago. So we were hanging out with him a little bit and Alex actually came to our base camp one day and he said, oh, we have a very famous Lincoln Hall on our team. So I knew he was on the team. Okay. So you are, as Lincoln is up near the, the, the summit, uh, losing it badly and then getting to the uh, second step, you're on your way up for your own summit attempt with, with who were you with? I was with a guy named Dan Mazur, who yeah, you know, we know. Um, yeah. and uh, another guy, Miles Osborne, Sherpa called Jangbu Sherpa, and one other guy, Phil Crampton. There's actually five of us going up. It was okay. a cold morning, and it was our second try in two weeks because we had been weathered off on a previous so morning. So this is your last chance to get to the top. Pretty much. We're not going to try again a third mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Doubtful, yeah. you know. So Running out of, well, you know how it is with the oxygen bottles and, you know, like yeah. we're scraping them together for a second try and stuff like that. So yeah, probably the last. And you, had you heard anything on the radio of the trouble that was going on up near the, the second step and with Lincoln? Not on the radio, because as we were coming to Camp 3, we were just climbing, um, you know, not on the radio. So, but when we came into Camp 3, his, uh, a guy from his team, Harry Kickstra, was just arriving at Camp 3 coming down from the top. And we had spoken a couple of times over the course of the trip, you know, and. Uh, so we just sort of met, actually, as I was coming into camp, he was coming down, and we just met, standing face to face, and I just said, so how did it go today? You know, it, it, it seemed, it was nice weather, I thought, well, mm -hmm. just, hopefully it's a routine day. He, he said, I had, we had a terrible day, I lost two people. And this, these people were? Well, Thomas Weber, yeah. who was the guy trying to climb with, uh, he had a vision yeah. issue, and his vision deteriorated, the high, higher he went, he died. And then he said, I, Lincoln Hall. Has also died. I was like, oh. So by that stage, Lincoln was being pronounced yes dead. Yeah, but you weren't dead. Or well, were you? that depends how you define death. <laughs> well, let's get to that point. How did you? you you're, you're going downhill. I mean, not <laughs> you're not going downhill as the problem, but in your head, you're going downhill. Your mind and body are really succumbing to cerebral edema, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so tell us about. You know, the Sherpas are obviously in a desperate situation to try and do something for you, but what are you doing? Well, it, well they got to the point where they could do no more because we, we, coming down the mountain, we, we now had to descend. We had the obstacle of the first step, which is the first difficulty when you're going up. And that's not particularly difficult, but when I couldn't move, and I'm not a small man, and, uh, and the Sherpas had had a 19-hour day anyway, um, with not just an average 19 hour day, but trying to control yeah, me, being, yeah. pulling my oxygen mask off and all that sort of stuff. So two of the Sherpas just had to keep going because they were, Pemba, who had dealt with Thomas's death, he was just totally exhausted emotionally and physically, and plus I'd cramp on him in the leg, which didn't help. And um, so, uh, yeah, so there were two Sherpas left with me and uh, they just watched my vital signs disappear, you know, no pulse no uh, breathing. I mean, it can be difficult to measure those at extreme altitudes, so that just for precaution's sake, they poke me in the eye, um, which is sort of like apparently- Get just, a reaction. Yeah, right? and no reaction. So, uh, and they radioed this back to Alex, our expedition leader, and uh, on two hours, after two hours, Alex didn't want to make the call, but he finally made the call saying, you have to come down and save yourselves. Now, in terms of death, uh, I actually don't remember that. Um, but I do remember having hallucinations. And Pemba put this together for me that, uh, he didn't intend to, but <laughs> it just came to me that when he, he saw me lying there in the snow, motionless, 
effectively dead, glazed eyes, looking up towards Everest. But meanwhile, I mean, you'd know from as mountaineers that when the sun's setting and you've got all those beautiful colours on the snow, unless you're at a camp, you're thinking, we got to get out of here, I've got to get out of here because the night's coming. Well, I wasn't thinking I've got to get out of here because I knew I was going nowhere. And so I could just enjoy this beautiful sunset and the shape of the peaks and, you know, those you know, the shadows and fantastic mountain scenery. But the problem was, not the problem, but the intriguing thing is that I was facing that way up at Everest, apparently, according to Pimler, and what I was seeing was this way. So the way I interpret that was that it was an out-of-body experience. And um, I had another one of those earlier on, on the second step. What had happened was I'd, uh, I had, um, I'd had a little snooze, you, you know, it's, yes, you'd know, it's a two-tiered mm -hmm. step, about uh, 70 feet or something, I think. Anyway, I had a little snooze there, and, the, the, and finally someone managed to trigger me to, to abseil, and, but I, I didn't get it right, and I just shot down the rope, swung into Ping Pemba, hit him with my cramp on, and then I swung back and managed to grab a ledge and pull myself onto that ledge and think of, oh, and just totally frightened. And then next thing I know, I'm 10 metres away, 30 feet out over the north face, this huge exposure, and there's me on the cliff. And, uh, and, and it was, that, that was fine, actually, <laughs> uh, in a way. But, and I didn't want to go back in there. Uh, but then the next thing, I, there was no control. I just, suddenly I was nose to nose with the cliff again. And I didn't want to let go because it was a pendule and, you know, this huge drop I'd just seen while I was out in the space. Anyway, so I did, the, I did the swing down and it was fine. So that was obviously an out-of-body experience as well. So, I mean, when talking about my death, I mean, there are hundreds of uh, recorded examples of that kind of out-of-body out experience in hospitals where, you know, the person's up on the ceiling seeing the doctors looking at their body, that kind of thing. And... Uh, and yeah, it's called near death, but it's basically death and back, I think is a better way to put it. Well, let, me, let me read a quote from, uh, by our friend Greg Mortimer, Australian, who uh, in, a, in a, uh, an article about what happened to you in Sydney was interviewed and he says, uh, he's still living it out on the mountain and he hasn't actually come down yet. He's trying to figure out what it all means. He died and now he's alive. He's trying to dig deep into his memories to make sense of it all. He doesn't really want to come back down until he sorted it all out. I mean, this idea of you know that and, and out of body experiences and you having died—it's really intriguing. I mean, it, it, it's a bit of a hairy dog story in a way, isn't it? But, hairy yak, yeah. Hairy yak, yeah. But uh, I mean, I can buy into it because years of climbing. But a lot of people say, "Wow, this is really weird." Uh, how? I mean, you're very clear and convincing and lucid about it now, but at the time. You know, you, you had cerebral edema and you, you, your, your memory's almost not there of much of this experience, but you, you have these little vignettes. Yes, I have some, the, the things that I do remember are very vivid. Yeah, like the hallucinations, uh, that being out off the cliff, uh, that sunset, um, and ultimately coming to in the middle of the night. Uh, I, that, was, that was very vivid. And so you came to in the middle of the night. At what point did you decide you weren't going to die? Well, I, as soon as I realised, well, I mean, it was obvious I was going to die. Because you're, you're, you're now, uh, let me just back up a little bit. The Sherpas have had to leave you. You're spending a night way above 8,000 metres with cerebral edema. I mean, you should die. Well, yeah, and uh, no, no, oxygen. no oxygen. I mean, I had been using oxygen. So when you don't have it, it's even worse than not ever, ever, ever having had it. So yeah, uh, but the hypoxia, the hypothermia, the, the exhaustion, the dehydration, uh, the cerebral edema, I mean, that's, that's a death sentence. Yeah. And I could, you know, and it was just like, bang, death. And then I thought, no, 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 it can't be death because I just had to go back to my family. I mean, that was, I've turned back on a lot of mountains and um, I always play it safe. And suddenly my one thing that I always do, which is come home, looked like it wasn't gonna happen. But were you, you terrified? Were you, uh, you know, sad? Were there well, well, emotions was, to grab onto? Well, I guess there was the, the shock of that reality and what it would mean to my family. I mean, for me, it would have been so easy just to, to drift off. And so, so I just knew I had to battle that drifting off. And um, I managed to do that by 
not by meditating, but because I've done a lot of meditating, I had the ability to focus. Not that I display that in everyday life, but when it needs, when it needs there, it's there. And uh, so I just focused on my physical body and the way to do that and not drift off was to just move a little bit, just sort of like rock from side to side. And if that got a bit hypnotic, go this way and, or, you know, or go like that. And, and just try and just make sure that I was staying focused on that, not letting my thoughts go anywhere. And so what actually happened then was that I knew that's what I had to do. And you know, sometimes when you're, you're climbing, you know you've just got to keep doing, you're not thinking about what you're doing, you're just doing the next bit and then the next bit. And there's no sort of, you're not, you can't think about what's ahead really, uh, because you've got to have everything in that, that moment. And that's what I got into was that state of just being in that moment. And so, so the past, suddenly wasn't there and the future wasn't there either, so which meant that fear wasn't there. But somehow I, I knew I had to just keep getting through and, and, until I got through to daylight. I mean, initially I realised first steps to get to daylight, but when I was in this focused state, I'd forgotten about daylight, I just knew I had to stay in this state. And that was why when Andrew and Dan and Jangbu and Miles came along, I greeted them in a very flippant way. Yeah, well, let's get to that uh, along the way here. So by this stage, the Sherpas have left you. They've been, they, they've been ordered to give up on trying to get you down any further because you're inert and uh, their lives are at stake. And so they've gone and they've taken your oxygen and so forth, haven't they? Yeah, my nice thermos full of fluid. And... Leaving you with nothing. Mm. And did you meet these Sherpas, Andrew, on the way down? Did they tell you what you would expect to find? No, we didn't meet them. No, we, I just saw Harry and we got the news and then we you know, went back to our tent to get ready to go up. So if anything, <clears> you anticipated finding more dead bodies up there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, that's um, pretty unsettling, you know, yeah. to, to be expecting that. But, so but the good I'm, thing about high altitude is you, you kind of, you're numbed, right? So mm. able to put that out of our minds a little bit. <laughs> it, it was a good thing. Otherwise you'd never do it. Yeah, mm. so you, yeah. you get out of your tents. So now we're, now, now we're at the morning of the 26th, right? Yes. Heading, you're heading to the summit. Yeah. Lincoln's still sitting up there. Yep. And so you head on to the summit and, and what do you find? We found, well, we had a, we were, we were going a little slowly actually, but we were going okay. It looked like we were going to summit and it was, it was a... Perfect day. It was a good day. It was, it was, it was calm. What, what time and all that? Um, right at dawn. And mm -hmm. it's pre-dawn actually. It's just getting light mm -hmm. and, you know, from the pitch black to the point where you can sort of make out shapes and, and you can see sort of where you are, you can see the drop emerging from the dark and you can see the summit appearing ahead. And we were quietly just sort of trudging along. You know, it's getting a little trickier around that play, that area mm. too. And, uh, but I, I was thinking, okay, you keep doing this and you're gonna summit today. You know, it's looking, looks good. And then literally, you know, uh, uh, 30 seconds or a minute later, I really remember this well. I, I, I could see Dan, Dan was in front and Dan just sort of moving off and I could see you sitting there. I was like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is alive there. I, you know, and so anyway, I was, just, I was confused and I said, what's this? And then we all gathered and then Lincoln made his famous and statement. What was your statement? I imagine you're surprised to see me here. Yes. <laughs> and we were all, we all just sort of. <laughs> now, did you do a double take? Did you automatically know this is Lincoln Hall who's supposed to be dead or what did you think? Well, that crept in pretty quickly. Um, Dan asked you what your name was, and you said Lincoln Hall, or I said Lincoln, and I, and I said something, oh, you're the white limbo guy. <laughs> and you looked at me like I was some kind of idiot, but. <laughs> <laughs> I have an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> well then, tell me what happened after that. I mean, this is. Uh... Well, it was really, it played out really slowly, um, because we were moving like zombies, you know, uh, but we talked to Lincoln. For the first while, it was just talking and sitting beside him. And, uh, you know, while we were sitting with you, um, you, you made a dive, like you were sitting right on the edge of, of, with your hand on the ridge crest, and you actually tried to jump off at least twice, <laughs> and Dan tackled you. Yes, uh, I do remember that bit. And I, we were very confused. I, I thought, oh boy, this, you, I, this guy doesn't like Americans or something. No, like I that. thought, this guy is going to die, is what I thought. And mm -hmm. I thought, you, I, it, was, it was horrible, actually. It was a really horrible situation, because we, we felt like, like we tried, you know, tried to push you, try to move you, but you're, you're, you are a big guy. 
and you were like a dead weight up there, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Literally, yeah. Yeah, and, and we just thought this is, I was, we weren't talking about it. We, I was just thinking this is going to go badly today. This is a bad situation. But we didn't, we just sort of hung out with you for a long time. And we eventually started pulling out like bottles, you know, of our half frozen slushy drinks. And you drank a tiny bit of that uh, off of Miles and myself. And um, we eventually, because we were moving slowly, you know, mentally, is you know, even more than usual. And um, Jang Bu tied you down. But hey, let's let's not let him jump off. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> or rely, roll off. Rely yeah. on the Sherpas to be practical. Because yeah. because the position yeah. is precarious. You know, you guys know because you've been there. But it's it's um, you know, there's not a lot of room to move there. And he's got his hand on the ridge crest with a ten thousand foot drop, and then. It's sort of like a slope like this. And you're kind of just in a little hollow, yeah. About that wide. Mm. Yeah. And how you stayed there all night is that's what amazes me. That he did it was pitch a very dark night. There was no moon, very little light, so it was a pitch black kind of night. Well the, all the hallucinations I had focused on me sitting and waiting. That was what I had to do. That was what I mean, totally other realities, but that's what the message was. And now there's this strange sort of, uh, again, you're straddling some, you know, two worlds. You, you're starting, you know, said, my name is Lincoln Hall or whatever you said, I'm Lincoln Hall. Um, you're rational enough to say that. You're rational enough to take these measures to meditate, stay alive. But at the same time, you take a flying leap, att attempt to jump off the Kangsheng face. What were you thinking? And I've read that, that you were thinking you're on a boat. And mm. <coughs> well, the, the way I can explain the the total craziness and the not so crazy, was that the cerebral edema seemed to be coming in waves, sort of like a pulsing of swelling. I don't know if that's quite the right way to put it. And this has been, having talked to uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and do doctors, or having them talk to me anyway, um, <clears throat> that seems to be what the only explanation for me being alive is the sort of mm -hmm. lessening of that cerebral edema, which really doesn't happen. It usually, usually just explodes and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I think that when I was in those more lucid uh, times, um, that, that was a lessening of the cerebral edema. But early on, uh, I think that early on, I was, I was totally crazy up higher. And uh, I'd say that, you know, this was one of these, when I, when I seemed lucid, I, you know, I sort of was to a degree, but obviously I just had another wave of craziness when I tried to, to throw myself off. So it wasn't, it was just a, a cyclical sort of situation. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so you were, <clears throat> you're up there, and now you guys must be on the radio mm -hmm. saying you found Lincoln. Yeah. But there's another part to this is that already, the call has gone out to your wife and two boys that you're not going to come home. Well, it didn't go to them directly, but um, they heard, yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, they got a message that I was in distress, and and they're back in Australia. To qualify. They're back in Australia, and Barbara, um, yeah, they got the message at night that well, they got a message that I was doing well, and that was because it was this pseudo. This, this radio call that sounded good, but in fact was just a mm. facade. So they got the message that I was dead, and the next morning, um, Barbara was, uh, um, uh, was, was meditating to try and relax, but what happened was she saw me walking towards her, um, and I was wearing this old fleece jacket from some Antarctic trip, but, we both remember, and I was walking towards her with a big smile, and, and then I came and I, I put my arms around her, and she felt me embracing her on this sort of, it was this white light uh, background, and, um, and she just sort of sh shrugged that whole thing off because she knew what that meant, and what that meant was that the was me dying. You gone. Yeah. Wow. So that, but, and, uh, but at some level, she, she didn't, couldn't believe that I was dead, and, but she thought that was just denial. Mm. So then the message is going down, and, and you guys rally uh, quite a huge rescue, mm. as I understand it. There were, how many people ended up getting involved to, to get Lincoln all the way down? Uh, I mean, looking at your pictures, Lincoln, it looks like about 12 or 14 Sherpas ended up coming up. 
Is, no, that, that, is that right? No, that was no. just a, at the Radisson Hotel. The, the reality of it was They were that, invited to the party. Yeah, they were, yeah I yeah. wanted everybody's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. I asked Alex, the exhibition leader, to bring all the Sherpas so I could get their side of the thing because I wanted to. It, was so, it seemed so... I, couldn't, I really couldn't take on board what had happened because it was just so extreme and bizarre. And uh, basically what happened was uh, Dan radioed to Alex and Alex took a lot of convincing <laughs> um, uh, in fact, that was a bit of a it, process. It, it was actually, it took a long time to do that because... To I mean, persuade people that Lincoln well, was alive? We don't. we didn't have their channel, for one oh. thing. So we had to radio our cook. And it was it was dawn, everybody sound asleep down in base camp. They didn't want to get up until the sun, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty hard to get that all going. Our cook had to go to your camp. And they didn't want to know. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to, <laughs> this, you got the wrong guy. Eventually, we were talking to Dan. Talked to him at first, and uh, Dan ended up giving, to Phil. giving me the radio. Oh, okay. And I, I spoke to Alex for a long time. Oh, okay. Trying to convince him that he said, "No, it can't be Lincoln Hall because we've already phoned his wife <laughs> to tell him that he's dead. Tell her that he's dead." So, um, but eventually, he said, "Yeah, okay. I've sent, you know, I've radioed the guys at Camp Three. They're coming up. Hmm. Uh, it's all going." So, but we still didn't know if you were going to live. Or not? No. I was still trying to imagine how it would all, how it, how it could work with you not able to stand up. Yeah. So what so, happened yeah. was, yeah. So what Alex uh, had um, was a couple. They, they had people up the mountain dism dismantling camp. So there were quite a lot of Sherpas up there from Russell Bryce's expedition, from our expedition. And so what Alex needed to do was to get some oxygen up there. That was the first thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he managed to do that. And. But that took four or five hours. Uh, and by that stage, the sun was out and I sort of blossomed like a sunflower, I gather. I mean, yeah. certainly I felt a hell of a lot better. And the, I was still sort of hallucinating. I mean, the thing about the, the hallucination I had about the boat was when you're, when you're a climber, balance is the one thing that you always have. I mean, that's how you manage to do what you're doing. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of mental stuff, but balance is just one of the givens. And so when I felt that my... That, my, uh, that I was swaying, my mind was saying, well, you can't be unbalanced because, you know, you've been, last two months, you've been balanced very well and you can't be unbalanced now. And in fact, of course, I was unbalanced. I was, that was, I was that far gone, I was losing my balance. But the way that my brain interpreted that was that I was actually on a boat. And that's not such a huge, um, not such a huge sort of leap in terms of my memory banks because I've spent, you know, a few seasons in Antarctica working as a climbing guide and weather mountains everywhere and you're on a boat. So that was sort of the thing that was brought out of the files and stuck into my mind. <laughs> and so that was where the boat thing came from. Interesting. Yeah. So now, okay, so, and for you, your climb has just now changed completely. Yeah. You, at what yeah. point did you just realise, uh, we're not going to the summit of Everest, we are now in a rescue mission. And t tell me about how that felt. You know, you, you've got to contend with this big ambition mm. kind of coming to a crashing end, but for obvious good reasons that you, you yeah. have to be there and, and help this guy. But talk, talk about that. Well, I, my memory is, is even when we pulled off to the side, I was thinking, and, and very soon as I thought, okay, that's, that's it. That's it. This is, uh, we're going to be with this guy now for the rest of the day or, or until he dies. Um, so I, I kind of knew right away that it was the summit wasn't going to happen that day. Mm -hmm. And obviously, after two or three hours, it was really obvious. And after four hours, it was yeah. nobody was even thinking about it, you know. Um, so it was, yeah, I kind of felt blank, the blank, empty feeling, if you uh -huh. know what I mean by that. Um, but not a sense uh, of, what about disappointment or, or oh, anger or something like? Um, you could have just kicked him off the ridge. No, I wasn't, I wasn't angry. No, <laughs> I, was, I was a bit depressed. Yeah. Um, to be truthful, I was, I was, uh, you know, in coming down up later that day, I was, uh, I just, I sort of, wow, I can't believe that just happened, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but as you, as you process that, losing the summit, and that's a big ambition for all climbers is Everest or any big mountain that they're trying to climb, but yeah. as you processed it, and you, you're sitting next to Lincoln now, and you're realizing you contributed to this guy being alive, I mean, how do you weigh all that up? Oh, well, it's easy now, you know. Uh, Actually, it was always easy uh, as far as that goes. So that's, that's really clear, you know, that, that it's way more, um, thank God he's here, you know, 
Uh, and it turns out that he's a really good guy. and <laughs> Just and me, as well, eh? Yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah, And, and uh, you know, I just think of the loss to his family that would have been. I mean, the summit is, yeah, it's a big ambition, but it's, it's really small compared to this other stuff. So uh, yeah. thank God that's the way it worked out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, I was, I was crushed, I'll be truthful. You know, I, and, and uh, we, you know, this whole thing with the media and all this stuff, I mean, I was going down thinking, okay, nobody's going to believe my excuse for not summoning this time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I was, you know, because I'm a school teacher and I had 800 kids at my school who knew what I was doing. I thought oh, they're yeah. just going to think he, I wimped out, or I, you know, like what was, what's why didn't you summon all those other hundred, you know, hundreds of people did? And I was thinking, well, well, there was a guy who you know needed some help, and we we did we ran out of time. I I just thought nobody would believe that, and I'd be, I just felt terrible about that. You know, I felt like I'd let eight hundred school kids down too, who were, who were watching me, you know, and all this stuff. So I was really shocked by how excited. Uh, everybody got about this, and um, the media. I learned a lot about the media, uh, how they take a story and they can do what they want with it, and make it. You know, at the time, yes, it was a big deal, but yeah. it, it wasn't it, to me. It wasn't. Uh, I guess I was feeling bad about a lot of stuff, you know, on the way down. But, so, it, but the aftermath is that you and and Dan and, and the other guys painted as heroes, really, aren't you? Yeah, which is which is hilarious, but because uh, because it was just to me it was a climbing trip, and um, okay, Everest is a big deal for as a personal ambition, but beyond that, these days it's been done by two thousand people and uh, three and a half. Oh, three and a <laughs> half. Oops. Okay, so anyway, it's 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 not a big deal in a lot of ways anymore. You know, like you're, but well, you can always go back. Yeah, you can always go back. That's right. And you probably will, won't you? I, I probably will. Yeah. 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 I mean. You know you can what's, do it. What's two months, you know, yeah. out of your life? <laughs> <laughs> but as for no. you, yeah. y you came, Lincoln, you, uh, they, they get you down. But it, in between, there's this moment when you communicate with Barbara, your wife, and she's got to contend with having lost you and then getting you back. How did that go in the moment when, isn't there a phone call, uh, a radio call that you managed to patch through to Barbara? Oh, you mean once I'm off the mountain? Well, at what point did first Barbara learn that you were going to make it down, but actually hear your voice? Oh, okay. Well, uh, well, I was off the mountain. I was at advanced base camp, which is higher than most mountains anywhere else anyway. Yeah. But um, I didn't... I mean, the thing is, what happened was uh, Kevin, uh, uh, who was a, a cameraman with uh, Harry Kickstra, uh, was the only was one of the few people left at advanced base camp apart from the cook and the, you know they were very it was a stripped down team really and uh uh he when he saw me it was it was it was his eyes were just like this and and i thought the you know the swedish women's beach volleyball team must have been behind me or something I said, well, what's the go and he said mate the rest of the world thinks you're dead and I thought, oh, and then suddenly the horror that that included Barbara. Yeah. <clears throat> and so then Kevin then scuttled off and got his mobile phone and, well, actually, yeah, Dr. Andre, who mm -hmm. Andrew knows, had dragged me into the tent and was starting to sort of look at my fingers, frostbitten fingers. Because yeah, you were a mess, weren't you? you were, I was a mess, yeah. yeah, yeah, I was a mess. I mean, I basically, once I got the oxygen up high, I was able to walk down the mountain, well, I mean, stumble and tumble, and but under my own steam. But there were a bunch of Sherpas there who could have stepped in if they needed to. But So anyway, so I was really exhausted by the time I finally got there. And so uh, Andre was looking after me and then uh, Kevin came in with a mobile phone and I remembered the number and I rang Barbara and I had a paralysed vocal cord apart from being totally dehydrated, I could hardly talk. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I kept saying, you know, it's me, it's me, and is that you, Lincoln? It's me. You know, and I told her the name. I told her the name of our snakes that we had <laughs> pets, and she didn't seem to twig into that. And then I said, look, I just hope you're not looking for another husband yet. And then she knew it was me. So. Wow, that's, that must have been quite insane for her to have to process loss, then regaining. And she's a very strong woman. She's a uh, She's a very strong woman. Mm. Well, I've met her and I remember that. Yeah. 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 It's good that you're alive. <laughs> yeah. And do you look at life differently now that you've been to the edge, come back? 
Well, yeah. I mean, people ask me about the summit, and I say, what? What summit? I mean, I'm sorry, just put it like that. But, no, I, um, I, but, I take that too. Yeah, who cares? But you know, it's it's you know, I, I didn't think about the summit for months afterwards. Actually, it, the, the achievement and all that, because really, it was the death thing that was to put it. There's no other term for it, really. Uh, the death thing was so extraordinary, and just my, I mean, as a you know, I practice. I'm a practicing Tibetan Buddhist, and so uh, the meditations I've done and the uh, un, you know, the glimpses of other levels of consciousness. I mean, a lot of things came together in that sense through what happened to me up there. So that was an extraordinary thing. But what was more amazing was, well, I guess what's brought me here was is the uh, uh, the humanity of the story. And just it was like when I got home, it was like attending my own funeral. And um, uh, in terms of you know, funerals are where people say wonderful things about the person who's died. And that's what was happening. And it was, it was coming from people in Brazil that I don't know and emails. And it was, it was an extraordinary thing. And it was sort of an overwhelming, um, overwhelming uh, thing. And I think, I mean, it, it was partly what happened to me, but it was also, you know, the, the British man, David Sharp, who, who was unable to be rescued by the time people realised he was alive, his legs were frozen solid. And where he was, you just can't carry someone down yeah. from there without a proper rescue team. So, so that that was a, a a big thing in the in the in the press because people have felt that David Sharp had been ignored and why didn't why didn't people decide to rescue him? And here I was rescued, and it was such a a Disney ending actually, and it was a really heartwarming thing for a lot of people. So, it certainly changed my view of life. I mean, you know. Uh, Nothing really matters. Well, I won't say nothing really matters, but everything's okay after that. You know. And has this changed your view of life? What happened? My view of or life. Or your sense of you know, your priorities about Yeah, it has. Yeah. Things. Yeah. I think, uh, well, a few things have that, and I have a family now. So as, you know, as I get older, yeah, my focus is changing, I guess, from, from the selfish climbing days to uh, understanding that. You know, we live with other people, and we have to take care of each other. Those kind of things, you know, uh, obvious enough, but but it's really, really brought it out strongly. I think really, really is forcefully. Yeah, um, yeah. Summits. Well, I've never been. I'm. I've always been willing to turn away from a summit if things weren't right. So, and I've done it many times. So. I could handle that, but it was this. It, you know, that was disappointing. But on the other hand, like you said, go back, try it again. Um, doesn't really matter. Yeah. So I guess it, that changed a bit. That changed a bit. And uh, we learned a lot of things up there. So yeah, it, was really and it was it was a hell of a neat experience, actually, in, in a lot of ways. It was really intense, and it was interesting. And for me, that's what life should be. You know, some of the time, at least. I so I I that that, that was. The experience was major, so that's good. Yeah, and I think we have a great friendship now, and uh, not many people can say that they, you know, the spark was was uh, a friendship occurred at twenty eight thousand feet. It took a little while for the friendship to, to develop, but um, mm -hmm. we ended up spending hours on the internet yeah. telephone and trying. Yeah, to work we out. literally had two hour conversations on the phone, which was yeah, we had a lot to talk about. So it was, it's been As good. You pieced it all together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, gosh, it's an incredible story, and yeah, it's a Cinderella ending, isn't it? Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. except I lost the glass, I lost the toe rather than the glass shoe. <laughs> it's only flesh. Yeah. <laughs> well, a fabulous story. Good to see you. Thanks, Both Greg. Both alive. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Greg.